To the latest episode of Slick Talk. I am your host, Joe, and on today's show, we have a little bit of a Q&A. We polled interesting questions that we've got in. Uh, these can, it really includes a wide range. Some of these are questions we've got in from existing customers. Some of them are from people who are maybe not a customer yet. Maybe they're thinking about trying us and they just want a little more background. And you also have a group of questions that come from people who are Maybe just hearing about oil analysis and want to get a recommendation. Maybe they want to know what oil we've commonly seen in a given engine, or maybe they just want to know what we would recommend um, in a given situation. So this is Ask an Analyst, the first volume. Over time, what we're going to do is gather up questions that we've got in, uh, maybe uh, in direct response to the show, and also just questions that are interesting that um, we analysts have got sent our way. So if you would like to have a question featured on the show, you can feel free to contact us via email just by using the bstone at blackstone-labs.com email address. You can also give us a call or just drop a question on our Instagram or Facebook page. But now, without further ado, we are going to get into some of these questions here. The first one is going to... Um, apply to obviously owners of vehicles that is uh, the classification of the person who sent this question in Um, but also you know we can apply this to pretty much whatever you might be sending a sample um, in from so the question is i'm about to send in the second sample from my vehicle how do i make sure you'll compare it to the first one so good question Um, if you uh, are certainly a new customer newer you've only sent one sample and uh, rest assured that we will do our very best to keep all samples from a given vehicle aircraft whatever you've got we're going to keep them all in one place and the way we do that is by tracking the unit id so on the slip that we send out with every kit there is a unit id field Um, the upper right hand corner and that is whatever you would like us to call what you're sampling so if it is a nickname you have um, you know a lot of people have a nickname for their car Um, if you don't have anything crazy uh, particular or interesting and you would just like us to refer to the uh, the year and the model, um, then that's perfectly fine to do. You know, it would be a 2016 Explorer, for example. Or if you have a nickname, uh, probably the most common one I see is The Beast. And I don't know, I don't know, um, I don't want to crush anyone's dreams, but that's actually a pretty common name. Feel free to use it, but we do see it a lot. Um, there, there can be some pretty interesting ones. I'm going to drop one little piece of advice. Please don't put profanity in your unit ID. I know it can sound like a good idea to incorporate some humor. And if you are going to incorporate humor, we welcome pretty much any and all kinds, except for the kind with profanity. It's not that we don't have that sense of humor like other people, but I mean, come on, keep it clean. Some of us are going to find certain things funny, and some of us are not going to find those same things funny. So, be as open, be incorporate as much of your personality as possible. Just stop a little bit short of the profanity when you're making a unit ID. But, if we have a unit ID set up, um, then we're going to first, you know, you send in a second sample, third, so on. We're going to look in our file. Um, or our database. We're going to go to your unit page. We're going to see if this is an existing unit. So we're going to match those up. If you forget to put your unit ID or you can't remember what it is, first of all, you can always contact us and ask. Or if you're in a rush and you just need to send in the sample, you can also just give us all the remaining details like vehicle, make, model, for example. Even if you left the unit ID field blank, um, but we can still see on the slip, oh, you know, this is a 2016 Explorer and he sent in a sample from a 2016 Explorer last year. You know, if everything like the odometer mileage and, and all that makes sense, then we can at least 
you know, get to the point where we're confident it's the same vehicle. You never have to ask for us to put all of the results from a from a given car, uh, for example, in the same file. Like we want to do that, and it's not something that you know you need to request because uh, the strength of what we do, a big strength of what we do, is is establishing trends. So we want to get all that data in one place. We're going to do our best to do so um, because it helps us out. And so it's not like a an added service or anything like that um, to have us group data together. So unit ID, make sure you fill it out. And if you do that, then we'll have the easiest way possible to compare samples. So that's the answer to the first question. That's what we're using uh, to make sure we keep all this stuff grouped together. Uh, so next question, uh, why are the numbers in the unit location column the same as the results in the first sample. Is this a typo or something is something wrong? So this is really, really common. Um, we might have this already addressed on our frequently asked questions page, um, but I'll still go over it here. So unit location averages, the unit location column is what we put on the page. So that way uh, you're able to develop your own set of averages in addition to what we have in our universal average file. So if it's the first sample from a vehicle, airplane, etc., then the results are going to be the same because that average, the unit location average, is a one of one. We don't have a second sample yet to make any sort of averages. So you can expect, and it's not an error, it's not a problem, you're going to have a duplicate of the results in your first sample in that unit location column. And then as you sample the vehicle or whatever it is again and again, you're going to get that unit location column to shift to reflect averages for your specific engine or transmission, etc. So yes, unit location column, if it's the first sample, that is supposed to be a replica of the results in your first test and then we'll get those values to shift over time. Now these are only going to be based on the particular engine you're sampling. So like say if you have three different cars, um, unless they all have the same engine, we're not gonna average all of your vehicles. We're going to average all of your samples from a specific engine type that you sampled. So you don't have to worry about those averages being impacted by anything except for the data that you've got from that given system, be that engine, transmission, so on. So next question we have, I was curious if makeup oil will affect your tests. I always run Lucas Petroleum Additive with my oil changes and occasionally run either seafoam or restore products. Will any of this affect testing? So this one's gonna take a little bit of time. Feel free to sit back, grab a beverage. There's a lot to go over here. So makeup oil is something we always want to know about because um, it's going to impact results by diluting down uh, the wear metals in the spectral exam. Um, so if you think about it this way, if you have a engine with a four quart capacity, say, and you added one quart of makeup, then you can expect the results, you know, metals to be 25% lower than they otherwise would be. Uh, so there's that to think about. We, we want to know about makeup for that reason, um, but also because uh, we're going to watch that as you sample a vehicle over time or whatever it is, we're going to watch it because an increase in makeup, um, say if you're sampling a 5,000 mile run, 5,000 mile run, the same interval over and over, and we see that makeup, oh, well, it's going, you know, it went from two quarts to five and then to seven. That can be something that even if the customer might lose track of and not notice, we can see it and we can see, oh, this could be a problem here. Um, there's something causing the engine to use more oil. Um, we'll look at wear metals, see if they connect. We'll, um, you know, obviously take into account other things like mileage on the engine. If it's a, an engine that's a really accumulated a lot of miles, uh, we're going to take that into account as well. Um, you know, that introduces the likelihood of something like a leaking rear main seal, something of that nature. So we're going to keep track of it, A, because spectral dilution is something to 
factor into when looking at metals. Um, they, it's simply going to allow metals to look better than they otherwise would be. Um, and we're also going to want to look for things like signs of a problem, um, you know, be it you know, maybe there's a cylinder area issue um, that's causing the engine to use more oil, um, other things. So makeup is something that will come into play in oil analysis. And the rest of this question is mainly about additives. So Lucas additive, this one's rather quick. Um, it will impact results, um, or it can, depending on how much you use, uh, by harmlessly raising the viscosity above the, uh, uh, let's call, should-be range. So this is a harmless effect of using Lucas, and it's not a problem. It's what the additive is intended to do. It's a viscosity improver. So if you're running like a 1540 and we find a viscosity, let's say measuring like 80 SUS, that would be a little thick for a traditional 1540. You mentioned though that you're using Lucas and we don't find any other like, you know, contamination that might also be raising the viscosity. You know, we don't see any, anything else out of line and you just have a thick viscosity with Lucas in use, then that's fine. That's a harmless effect of using the oil additive and feel free to do so. We'll take it into account. Again, we like to know about it because that way if we know an additive is in use, then we can put aside other possibilities, um, you know, like excess heat or, or soot or, or other things that could be raising the viscosity. So we like to know about it. And lastly, seafoam and restore. Um, fuel additives like seafoam, not a problem. Um, they don't really show up because they will burn up as the engine reaches operating temperature. In the event, though, that seafoam you know, had a chance to get in uh, the crankcase and not be burned off, um, then it could impact testing by lowering the flash point, thus mimicking fuel dilution. We use the flash point to check for fuel. Basically, any solvent, be it gasoline or a cleaning additive like that, it can lower the flash point. So good to know about, but usually seafoam does not play a role. Uh, moving along, though, restore restorer products do play quite a role because they contain a very high concentration of copper and lead. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Basically, if you're wanting to monitor brass and bronze wear, you know, from parts like bearings, if you want to monitor that really closely um, using oil analysis, then don't use Restore, pretty simply. It's going to inflate copper and lead, harmlessly so, but basically in testing we can't separate, okay, this is how much copper and lead came from his engine, and this is how much came from Restore. Because not everyone's using the same concentration of Restore, not everyone, you know, there's not a good... A reasonable baseline for us to say, aha, you would naturally have this amount of metal coming from the additive and this amount coming from um, the engine itself. It's it's hard to suss that out. And if, if you want a really genuine overview of how the engine is wearing in those areas, then I would just recommend not using the additive. Then again, though, if, if you have no issues um, to suspect there, um, then feel free. Yeah, I mean, use uh, use as much restore as you want. You know, we can obviously, we can still look at how the engine is wearing in other areas. We just can't really talk too much about brass and bronze wear. Um, so it's a good idea if you're interested in, in used oil analysis. Before you use an additive, maybe, you know, do exactly, you know, what this customer did. Contact us, see what the uh, results can be of using a given additive, and then, from there you can proceed. Like if, if you are a person who, you know, say you have a car and you're worried about bearing wear, don't use Restore. Um, you know, if you're a person who's worried about a coolant leak in their car, don't use Arch Oil or Revex just because that additive we've talked about in previous episodes contains the same elements that we use for coolant markers or that will show coolant. So yeah, it's a good idea to, to kind of first weigh the, the, problems you might suspect or that you might be looking for, and then look into using additives after that. So that way you can be confident that they are not going to um, skew your tests in any uh, particular way. So yeah, all good questions there grouped into one. Um, and here's, here's one that we get uh, pretty often. I'm thinking of doing an engine flush on my O2 Ford 73 Power Stroke Diesel. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, well, our main thought, I guess, from an analyst perspective, 
uh, would be that an engine flush is it's just another additive that we'd like to know about um, in the sense that it can impact testing by lowering the flash point. Um, it can also sometimes shake loose, you know, obviously the point of a flush is to clean out the engine, um, and they will do that. Uh, flush can shake loose some sludge buildup um, around the crankcase. So say if you have a sample, you just used a flush, the flash point is low, we might also see something like um, a lot of insolubles. Those are solids in the oil. And sometimes a high insolubles reading can mean the oil filter struggled to keep up. Um, or that the oil oxidized rapidly. But if we know that you used a flush, then that can offer a really good harmless explanation for why we might have found a lot of solids. So something that we certainly like to know about, but it will not stop us from looking at the sample and uh, giving you a general overview of engine wear and, and other things too. And before we get to the next question, this is your reminder to please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. If you're listening on a platform like Apple Podcasts that allows you to leave a review, um, a star rating, please do so. And always, always feel free to share the show, you know, with any friends, family members, people you think might be interested um, in the crazy world of oil analysis that we, uh, that we occupy. So... Back to the questions, though. We have just looking for signs the engine is in good shape. How new or old should the oil be before a sample is sent? So ideally, if you're sampling a car, you could get at least a 1,000 miles on the oil. That's enough use to give us a, a decent overview. Still, though, you know, sampling anything close to a you know, the typical interval for the car, be that what the factory recommends, or, you know, if you're usually change of the oil every 3,000 miles. Basically, getting a, a fair amount of use is, is a good idea because that kind of, it, it, it takes us away from, from having a sample, say, with just like a 50 miles on it. Most, if not all, of the metal in a sample like that is going to be carryover from the last fill. Um, not entirely new wear. So we can't really assess just how this engine is wearing on a per mile basis. But when you have a, a you know, like we talked about, at least a thousand miles um, on there, then we're able to get a pretty decent look at how much metal this engine is making per mile, if that matches up with our averages or not. If you're sampling, you know, like an airplane, at least 10 hours is, is, is pretty good. Um, but there are situations, though, you know, when you're, when you're talking aircraft where a shorter interval, you know, we're, we're going to applaud that if it means that you, you know, you're changing the oil more often to help, you know, keep corrosion from getting in the system. In that sense, you know, when you have, when you have airplanes and, and corrosion is such a big uh, concern, um, shorter intervals, are going to be of the utmost priority if you can't like maintain an active flight schedule. Um, but for cars where where calendar time is not an issue, you know when oil is not going to spoil in the crankcase. If you're talking any automotive application, anything um, you know, any car that is made, you know, at least from the 90s on, you really don't need to worry about calendar time. So just rack up some mileage. You know, ideally something. Close to factory recommended, um, or at least a thousand miles, gets you some decent uh, look at how the engine is really wearing. So this is an aircraft question here. Um, we have a question about expiration dates with oil. What is the limiting factor with the expiration date on oil? Is it that some of the additives break down over time? Is there a problem with using this expired oil? They had uh, 10 cases of AeroShell W100+. Plus. Um, so good news here. While there are expiration dates on the container, um, we do not find that calendar time, you know, just having, you know, when you're talking oil that is just sitting in the jug, um, that's usually not a problem. And if you want us to check a sample for serviceability, if you want good peace of mind uh, before putting that product into use, then you can feel free to send it in and we'll look, we'll look for anything unusual. Um, but actually, expiration dates, they're just not 
too pivotal, you're going to be able to still use that oil. Uh, but it's something that we understand if there could be some trepidation. So feel free to send a sample in if you want to know um, how it looks. But you don't really need to put that into uh, an area of concern, um, which is a good thing. And that means you don't have to watch those dates too closely. Next question, the manufacturer recommends changing the oil filter every other oil change. You mention this online and you will be hung afterwards. I get that the filters really aren't a lot of money, but why would they recommend it if it was a bad idea? We generally listen to the service recommendations. Why do we ignore this one? And yeah, um, so to break this down, I think most people change the oil filter along with the oil because it's just easier a lot of the time logistically to keep track of uh, your your maintenance plan. It's easier to just do both the oil and the filter. Um, but also, I just think it's, it's a peace of mind thing. Um, people want to uh, be as cautious as they can. Um, so they'll override what the manufacturer might recommend there and uh, just want to change the oil filter. Again, it's something that you can always confirm in testing. If you're not entirely comfortable um, with keeping an oil filter in use for two intervals, then you can always send in a sample. And using our insolubles test, we can let you know how an oil filter is or isn't holding up. So you can confirm that in testing. But yeah, I just to answer the question, I just think, uh, A, it's it makes life easier if people can just handle all the maintenance they need to right away and also it's something that's peace of mind related people just want to they want to have uh, things sewn up and put to bed as best they can so last question here is there any issue running an analysis on four different blends of mobile one such as 040 016 030 and 050 would you ballpark the viscosity any issue on TBN readings? So yeah, obviously viscosity is the main thing. Um, if you combine four different blends, you might end up with a viscosity that doesn't necessarily fit a particular one. Um, it might be on the borderline between a couple, and that's not a problem, I would say. Um, it just means that you know you have four different blends, and you might not have a, a result that fits squarely in any particular range, but I mean, if you're mainly wondering how well the oil is working, um, you know, based on wear results and based on, you know, every other test, then yeah, I mean, you might have a funky viscosity, um, but if that's not really something, I mean, I suppose there's just so much else that you can glean um, from a sample. So even if you have an interesting viscosity, I mean, it's not what we would consider a problem. It's not something that will keep us from telling you how the engine's doing. Um, so yeah, you might end up with an interesting viscosity, but that's really no issue. Um, as for the TBN, you know, the TBN is going to be based on um, how much detergent dispersant additive you have in there from the start. So if you just happen to mix together um, four different blends and, and they have a lot of those additives, uh, such as like calcium, magnesium, boron, those are detergent dispersant additives. Um, if you have four blends and, and they all have, you know, that uh, that hefty additive package that will boost TBN, then who knows? I mean, you might you might end up with a TBN that's still pretty strong by the time you're, you've finished your oil run. But yeah, it's really just about what additives are in those oils. Um, for example, if you had a, a really low TBN, um, but all four blends you added just didn't happen to have you know, none of them happen to have much detergent dispersant and you had a low TBN, that wouldn't go to show that you put together a terrible blend of oils. It just, it's all about what's in those to begin with and, and combining these together. If it's all oil that, uh, that the engine's able to run, um, then you can feel okay about it. Uh, the TBN's really going to be based on things like how much detergent dispersant is present, um, how much, you know, how long the oil was run, if it was run a long time, and you have a, a low TBN. Again, not a problem with the oil. Um, it just had to reach the end of its usefulness. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to worry about skewing the results. Um, you don't have to worry about that. 
uh, the TBN is just going to be um, based on the product you've got and how long it was used. It's basically you won't somehow keep us from determining uh, how much active ad it was remaining. So, again, this is all good stuff to, you know, if you aren't sure about it, um, it's it's always a good rule of thumb to let us know. It's really useful to have as much background uh, info as we can. Um, that's what we want. Um, so that way, you know, it's the same thing as when you go to the doctor's office and you, you know, you have to fill out all the paperwork about what you've done in your life and um, what all illnesses you've had or, or et cetera. Well, all that information is important because it's going to help them see how you're doing. And it's the same for us. We we want to have as much background info as we can. And uh, it's all in a mission to, to help you out and give you the best analysis possible. So that wraps up our first edition of Q&A with the Analyst. Uh, we look forward to putting together our next set of questions. And in the meantime, always feel free to send yours in. Again, you can contact us via email at bstone at blackstone-labs.com. You can also contact us on our Instagram, Facebook, phone call, whatever you want to do. If you do want to give our office a call and ask to speak with the analyst, the phone number is 260-744-2380. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. Thank you.